Glory to Jesus Christ. So we're reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and this will be the the four year roundup. I think it would twenty twenty. I started it up, and uh, during COVID, and we've uh, come to that. But I'm going to start all over again from where I started off again. Uh, which was in the prayer section. That's where I started. So, and we're, uh, and this is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the second edition, the uh, 2019 reprint of the 2016 second edition, which is not, not much different from it all. It's a little edition of Pope Francis's stuff on capital punishment. And uh, there's also the the white, the smaller white one, the, the so-called pocket, but you'd have to have kangaroo pockets to carry it around. And so this is uh, published by Libreria Eritrice Vaticana, which is the Vatican publishing house and bookstore. And this is uh, also available in at www.usccb.org. I think you can buy it there. A publication number 7-649. And you can also get it free online from the uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, usccb.org slash sites slash default slash files slash flipbooks slash catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, or at www.vatican.va, Catechism of the Catholic Church, and, and go to English on that. Or you can get a PDF drive, a free download ebook of the Catechism of the Catholic Church from Catholic Culture. Catholic Culture. So we're on the end of uh, part one, the Creed, the 12 articles of the Creed, and we're at. I believe in the life of the world to come and uh, everlasting life. And we're at the uh, the in brief, the summary, and also uh, a little a, a little thing on a commentary on the word "Amen," "Amen." So be it. And also, we'll look at uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. With theological commentary by uh, uh, edited by Archbishop Rino Finiskella, which is uh, published by uh, it will be uh, Cardinal Ladaria, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, which I'm probably not. And that's published by our Sunday Visitor in 2019, Huntington, Indiana. So let's pray first. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, who are everywhere present, and filling all things, O treasury of blessings, and giver of life, come dwell within us and cleanse our souls, O gracious Lord. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. So this is page 274, the end of part one the uh, section 12, uh, article 12, number 1051 on page 274, page 274 in the second edition. Every man receives his eternal recompense in his immortal soul from the moment of his death in a particular judgment by Christ, the judge of the living and the dead. 
So uh, some people think, well, you uh, you are in quote unquote soul sleep, and uh, there's uh, there's no consciousness, but that doesn't really scan with the New Testament, especially the the, the Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah. Somebody said, "Well, Elijah didn't, wasn't dead; he was assumed uh, bodily into the heavens." And uh, <clears throat> but we, uh, you're conscious. You're conscious. You're, it's not waiting to the resurrection, the bodily resurrection, to to be quote unquote spiritually alive. You're, our souls are immortal. But our bodies definitely aren't, as I can tell you from my own experience in aging. But it will be. Our bodies will be resurrected. They will be immortal and perfected and uh, brought to fulfillment. And uh, uh, Father Hickey was talking about his brother Danny today and uh, who has special needs. Uh, and uh, he said he's now come to his fulfillment. He's a, a, a great, uh, you know, intellect and everything that is the, the, uh, the innocence of his life uh, brought to fulfillment and no, no limitations uh, except that of the human nature, but the human nature that will be that's glorified, that's, that's uh, brought to, to fulfillment. And, uh, and there's with this everlasting growth in, in God uh, for those who are to stand the particular judgment, those who have persevered in grace. 1052, we believe that the souls of all who die in Christ's grace are the people of God beyond death. On the day of resurrection, death will be definitively conquered when these souls will be reunited with their bodies. That's uh, St. Uh, Pope, or is he? Uh, yeah, Pope St. Paul, isn't he now? St. Paul the Sixth in the Credo of the People of God, number 28. We, 1053, we believe that the multitude of those gathered around Jesus and Mary in paradise forms the Church of Heaven. So, uh, Mary, and of course, all the, uh, not just Mary, of course, all the members of the body of Christ, everybody who is in, in the reality of grace, all those gathered, and they, we're gathered around Jesus, who's the center of the universe, uh, the, uh, who has the, the fullness of materiality in his humanity, in his resurrected uh, and uh, the fullness of, of God of, of, from all eternity, equal with the Father and Holy Spirit as one being, one God, yet distinct in nature, distinct in his natures. And so we form the Church of Heaven, which is the church gone home, grace gone to glory, as Father Conley used to say. So, and of course, there's the, the church on earth, the struggling church, and then the church in heaven, which is, I always think of, you know, we're running the race, and they're in, the, in the, the stands cheering us on and helping us in varied ways. And then, of course, there's the church on the porch, shall we say, on the porch of the, of the grandstand, the uh, church, uh, which is often called the church suffering, uh, but... Uh, I always liked St. Catherine of Genoa. Uh, the statement, oh, is it the, when she would correct people, would say, oh, the poor souls of purgatory, oh, the blessed souls of purgatory, who are uh, closer than we are to the, the total fulfillment. And, and they, can't, they can't backtrack. They can't fall. They're, uh, they're, because they're out of time and space. It, it, uh, uh, Changing your mind as a time as an aspect of time and space. 
But somebody said, well, what about the rebellion of the angels? Well, that's, that's a, they're, they're a different set of being altogether. So, uh, but where in eternal blessedness they see God as he is, and where they also had see Christ, Christ glorified, and see everybody else glorified. <coughs> see God incarnate, reared in all his splendor. And also experience fully the Father and the Holy Spirit. But then it's a, a fullness that's always growing because God is infinite and eternal. Where they also, where they are also to various degrees associated with the holy angels and the divine governance exercised by Christ in glory by interceding for us. So they, the saints help us, those in heaven, and those uh, in purgatory also, those the, the saints in purgatory. Well, I might put that in quotes, but, uh, but as well as the saints on earth, those who are, are persevering in grace. And there are, ma there are many perfected saints on earth who are... Uh, we've we've all run across them, who are uh, just so full of virtue in, in a humble way, uh, not without you know human flaws and things, but but full of virtue by interceding for our and helping our weakness by the fraternal concern. Again, Saint Paul the Sixth, Pope Paul the Sixth, in the cradle of the people of God, number 29. And this is page 275. Those who die in God's grace and friendship, imperfectly purified, although they are assured of their eternal salvation, undergo a purification after death, so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of God. And that's the basic thing of purgatory. You know, that's, everything else tends to be uh, an elaboration on that and sometimes speculation on this. And as I, I've said before, more people tend to base their view of heaven, hell, and purgatory more on Dante than on scripture or uh, the, the apostolic tradition or the development of apostolic tradition. By virtue of the communion of saints, this is 1055, the church commends the dead to God's mercy and offers her prayers, especially the holy sacrifice of the Eucharist on their behalf. As I've mentioned repeatedly, the sacrifice of the Mass is not a repetition of Calvary. It is Calvary. It's the presentation, the uh, real presence of that. So uh, offered in an, un un an unbloody mode, of course. And uh, this communion of saints, which we talked about in the uh, in that article on the creed, is the, the mystical body of Christ, St. Paul's image. And so we're all connected. We're all connected. We help each other with our prayers. We say, well, how do we help the saints with our prayers? Well, we, you know, pray for their intentions. So uh, it, we say in the morning offering, even, even Christ and his humanity, we <clears throat> pray for his intentions. Oh, this. Oh, Jesus, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I offer you my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings of this day for all the intentions of the Sacred Heart in union with the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass throughout the world. So this is... Uh, so we, in what sense, pray. we're praying in and in Christ, joined, joined, joined to, joined to Him, as our as the head, the head of the body, and as our one mediator with the Father. Ten fifty six. Following the example of Christ, the Church warns the faithful of the sad and lamentable reality of eternal death. also called hell. So that's 
uh, it's again it's an analogy to to physical death but it's it's the total alienation chosen alienation embraced alienation from god and with with, with its final final result of total alienation from everybody else including yourself and and your total dehumanization you don't become a demon though demons are angel fallen angels so let's hope you don't become you you, you don't uh, follow the pathway to hell and let's pray that I don't either because we can all throw we have this freedom of the will we can throw salvation back in God's face there's no such thing as irresistible grace there's no such thing as once saved always saved 1057 hell's principal punishment consists of eternal separation from God in whom alone man can have the life and happiness for which he was created and for which he longs. But we don't uh, pass sentence on people. That's up to God. That's, that's an idolatry. That's, that's usurping a role of God, a, a quality of God, ascribing it to human beings, ascribing it to ourselves, claiming it for ourselves. Because we, we are not omniscient. We can't know all that. So, uh, and some people say, oh, why do you pray for that person who's such, it's just, uh, you know, totally lost. Uh, the, the, even that the, uh, the person's uh, behavior may literally be atrocious. Uh, and the person may be a monster. Even I will still pray for that person. And even in death, I'll pray for the person. You never know. You never know about if the person had uh, last second penitence. And we don't, or we don't know all of the circumstances of the person, how messed up the person was or whatever. So I always pray, it can't, it can't hurt. And uh, God can always apply it to somebody else if the other person doesn't want it. In the reality of hell, they don't want it. Hell is 1058. The church prays that no one should be lost. Lord, let me never be parted from you. If it is true that no one can save himself, it is also true that God desires all men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2.4, and that for him all things are possible, Matthew 19.26. 10.59. The Holy Roman Church affirms, affir uh, firmly believes, and confesses that on the day of judgment, all men will appear in their own bodies before Christ's tribunal to render an, an account of their own deeds. The Council of Lyon, uh, the Second Council of Lyon, in 1274. 1060. At the end of time, the kingdom of God will come to its fullness. Then the just will reign with Christ forever, glorified in body and soul, and the material universe itself will be transformed. God will then be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 28, in eternal life. And on page 276, amen. That's how it ends. Our prayers end in amen, amen. And so it does the creed, because the creed is also a prayer. It's the proclamation of faith, uh, but it's, it's a great act of faith. Amen. 1061, the creed, like the last book of the Bible, the Revelation 22, 21. So if you're ever on Jeopardy and says, what's the last word? It's amen in the Bible. <clears throat> the last book of the Bible ends with the Hebrew word, amen. This word frequently concludes prayers in the New Testament. The church likewise enters prayers with Amen. 1062. In Hebrew, Amen comes from the same root as the word believe, believe, faith, Amen. And this root expresses solidarity, trustworthiness, faithfulness. And so we can understand why Amen, Amen, may express both God's faithfulness towards us and our trust in him. 
1063. In the book of the prophet Isaiah, we find the expression, the God of truth, literally the God of the Amen. That is, the God who is faithful to his promises. He who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. The Amen, the God of Amen. Our Lord often used the word Amen, sometimes repeated. Sometimes, the, I think the New American often translated, I solemnly assure you. But it's Amen, and if he's really emphasizing them, Amen, Amen, I say to you. So in the... Uh, Six forty-eight. Yes. See Matthew six two and five and sixteen and John five nineteen, among other places. To emphasize the trustworthiness of his teaching, his authority founded on God's truth, divine truth. Oh Lord, have mercy! That an engine, a, a siren, just went by. Ten sixty four. Thus, the creed's final amen repeats and confirms its first words: "I believe." To believe is to say amen to God's words, promises, and commandments, and to entrust oneself completely to Him. So that's true. Uh, faith, uh, which is not just an intellectual thing, not just an emotional thing. In fact, it's not a, really an emotional thing, but uh, an, or just a volitional thing. It's it's a dedication. It's entrusting oneself completely to Him, who is the Amen, the faithful one, the Amen of infinite love and perfect faithfulness. Because being infinite love and eternal love, God has to be more than one person. Because love is relationship, and if God is the only being in eternity, which he is, the only eternal being, and the only infinite, then God has to be more than one person. There has to be with infinity there has to be diversity. So and uh, some would say, well, why do Christians just have three? Why don't they have a million, a billion, a, a quadrillion, a, a, a Google of, of, of that, an infinity of it, in fact, of, of incarnations, or not incarnations, of, of um, hypostases of being, uh, because Jesus only revealed that. Jesus revealed three in Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of, Hashem, which is uh, a euphemism for God, the, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Christian's everyday life will then be the amen to the I believe of our baptismal profession of faith. Because remember the creed was, the, the kernel of the creed anyway, was the, uh, uh, the uh, was baptismal. May your creed be for you a mirror. Look at yourself in it and see if you believe everything you say you believe and rejoice in your faith each day. St. Augustine, Sermon 58, comma 11, comma 13, Patrologia Latina, 38, comma 399. May your creed be for you a mirror. So it's not just some some words. It's our profession, our profession of life. 1065, Jesus Christ himself is the amen. He is the definitive that's uh, Revelation 3. 14. 
He is the, which also means he's God. He is the definitive amen of the Father's love for us. He takes up and completes our amen to the Father. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why we utter the amen through him to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20 Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. So that's the uh, Eucharistic Prayer 198, common idea for the Roman Missal. That's the, uh, the peripsum, that's the, where the host is elevated at the end, uh, or both. Uh, both Chalice and Host. Through him, with him, and in him. So we get to God the Father through Jesus, but also with Jesus and in Jesus. And in the Holy Spirit, too, of course. Uh, because God is one being. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, which is our great unity, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. So let's look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church with theological commentary. Archbishop Bruno Finiscalla, page 267. Page 267. Gaudium et Spes 39 takes up precisely, that's, got, that's the, uh, for the documents of Vatican II, which takes up precisely the biblical tradition of the transformation of the cosmos. So the whole, we're just, that's, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the, uh, we're not quote unquote spiritualists. We don't just believe that, uh, you know, that, uh, the soul is all that matters, and we escape matter, but no, we'll, we'll be transformed in matter. We will be uh, immortal bodies as well as immortal souls, and transformed bodies as well as transformed souls, in the power of grace, totally pervaded by the energies of God. If, of course, we persevere in grace. perhaps a bit forgotten in later times of this transformation of the cosmos. In first place, there is mention of the uncertainty about the when and the how of the ending and the future world. Christian eschatology cannot describe the world that we await because it surpasses our imagination and our capacities. But this does not diminish the certainty of faith in the new dwelling that the Lord prepares for us the new heavens, and the new earth. Now, the world that we await embraces all the dimensions of present reality. Without doubt, it is above all a gift of God, but at the same time, the fruit of the human response to the gift and to grace. This is why hope in the new earth does not reduce our interest in this earth, but on the contrary increases it, because in hope of the future transformation, our efforts in this world are radically saved from vanity and from the transience that characterizes our present condition. What we do in this transitory world for the good of our brothers acquires dimensions of eternity. The Council spells out very well, on one hand, the discontinuity between our present condition and that of the future. The Council, of course, the Second Vatican Council. We need to distinguish between earthly progress and the kingdom of God, among other things, because this progress is often ambiguous so we, and also uh, deceptive, because all sorts of things are promoted as progress. Just look at the progressives of today, which often it, uh, it's certainly not moral progress that often they propose. Um, 
And, and it's interesting that whatever change they want, no matter how really retrograde it is or immoral, uh, people uh, right and left uh, will claim that it's progress. Because this progress is often ambiguous. It can represent an advancement in some respects and a regress in others. And sometimes it's not an advancement at all. It's a total regress. <coughs> On the other hand, however, continuity is also indicated. This progress, real the, uh, uh, the, the, the St. Paul VI, Pope Paul VI points out in Progressio Populorum, the progress of the peoples. This, you know, it's a, an obligation to uh, advance uh, the uh, the human race, to advance, uh, to wipe away the tears, to uh, aid those who are uh, distressed, those who are uh, especially impoverished, through no fault of their own. Inasmuch as it contributes to the improvement of human society at all levels, is not indifferent for this kingdom that we await. And this is why God does not want to destroy our efforts or its fruits. He wants to transform it. He, because he wants to transform the world on which the work of man is engraved. For this reason, we find transformed and purified everything that we shall have done in this world according to the command of God. So, uh, our sinful ravaging of uh, the world and society and people uh, certainly will not uh, get away with it, so to speak. We, uh, there will be, it will be healed by God, by the ultimate. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest, Jesus said, and which only God can say. For this reason we find transformed and purified everything we shall have done in this world according to the command of God, in docility to the power of his spirit. Everything in which we have been truly cooperators of God in the fulfillment of his design will be part of the new heavens and the new earth. And in some manner, therefore, the discriminating and purifying judgment of God to which we have made reference, also relates to human work in the world and must separate what man will have done according to God from the things in which man will be opposed to his saving plan. This purified and transformed world also forms part of the kingdom that Jesus will present to the Father at the end of time, when everything will be submitted to him. God will be all in all, again, 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty eight. Therefore, the heavenly gifts that the Father gives us through the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, do, do, excuse me, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit, together with the universe of things he created and guides towards fullness, constitute the eternal life that we await. And then his commentary on Amen. Uh, but, but this is by uh, the editor, uh, Archbishop Rino Finiscella, not by uh, Cardinal Ladaria. Luis, I think it's Luis Ladaria, or Ladaria, however it's pronounced. Uh, page 869, Amen by Archbishop Bruno Finiscella. It is meaningful that the conclusion of the first part of the Catechism of the Catholic Church should end with a short understanding explanation of the term Amen. It is well attested. Amen is a term that recurs often in the life of the Church. Our prayers end with Amen, and so do the creeds. As number 1064 notes, the intention of the Amen, that's the Catechism, of course, is to testify to the faith that has been professed. 
The term amen is presented as the simplest word and at the same time as the word bearing the most commitment. It has been imprinted in all the modern languages in the same original Hebrew form. I remember when we learned uh, uh, Notre Père and, and uh, Je vous salue Marie, the, the Our Father and the Hail Mary in French. In my day, it was Ainsi soit-il, they had translated the uh, Amen to, you know, that it may be. Uh, let it be uh, for that, but now I think they say Amen. In French. As if to, it has been imprinted in all the modern languages in the same original Hebrew form, uh, different pronunciations, as if to witness to the sacrality of the term that cannot and should not be modified due to the high value it possesses. In sacred scripture, the use of Amen is differentiated. Somehow, a biblical text can help us enter more directly into its profound meaning. We are at the time of King David and of his decision that Solomon, the son he had from Bathsheba, would succeed him on his throne. King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehodiah. Oh, yo, no, Jehoiada, Jehoiada, Jehoiada. So they came before the king, and the king said to them, Take with you the servants of your lord, and cause Solomon, my son, to ride on my own mule. Because the donkey or the mule, would, uh, the king would ride on that in, uh, in peacefulness. In, in, well, I remember Solomon's name, Shlomo, is uh, from Shalom, from peace, harmony. And uh, the, on a horse, it would be uh, as a warrior. Ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet. Because remember, this was, there was a... Uh, a usurpation of, uh, well, or uh, 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 jumping the gun, shall we say, of the oldest son. Uh, uh, when uh, Bathsheba had David promised that it would be Solomon who would be uh, uh, succeed him. And you shall come and say, and uh, blow the trumpets and say, long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my stead. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, answered the king, Amen. That's your note, Amen. Amen. May the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king, say so. As the Lord has been my Lord, the king, even so may it be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord King David. So that's from First Kings 1, 32-37. The Amen, so be it, pronounced by the prophet Benaiah, has a double meaning. On one hand, it indicates that the prophet has understood the will of King David, he approves it, and joins in even expressing the prediction that the Lord himself will be able to make the king's word happen. On the other hand, the Amen indicates that the prophet is ready to fulfill everything that is required so that the order be executed. As we can see, a relationship exists between the word that the, what the word of the king calls for and what its realization involves. The Amen, pronounced by the prophet, bears witness that in so much as it is the will of King David, it must be carried out. So a twofold relation is expressed. The objective relation, that refers to the order expressed, 
which must find a response in its actualization, and the subjective relation that is caused between the person who pronounces the Amen and what he confirms with his concrete action. So the Amen should lead to concrete action in prayer or in profession of faith. The prophet then pronouncing his Amen indicates both his awareness of David's will and his assent to that will. This involves the submission of his person in conformity to the message and his commitment to realize it. At the end of the creed, when the believer pronounces his Amen, he intends to express above all that he knows what he has professed and that he desires to express it concretely in his daily life. The creed, therefore, is placed on two important columns that express the same unitary act from the beginning to the end. With the first, I believe, the believer testifies of accepting the truth of everything that will follow in his profession of faith and of receiving it into himself, basing that acceptance on the testimony of God himself. With the last amen, I believe, he confirms the faith expressed and commits himself to give testimony to it. Concluding this first part with the Amen, the Catechism of the Catholic Church moves from the Creed to enter into the celebration of the Christian mystery with the liturgy. From there, because the expression of the liturgy is the lex orandi, lex credendi, the, the law of praying is the, the law of believing. So it should, of course, that, which is why there, there should be uh, ever greater precision in liturgical prayer. Uh, and especially in the Latin tradition, the Roman tradition, uh, where uh, but in the Eastern traditions it's more exuberance, uh, that, but it's also uh, expressing the, the fullness of the faith. So, from there, passing on to the commitment of living as disciples of Christ, it will enter into the fourth part with Christian prayer, which is the part that I'm going to start on. Uh, tomorrow. The Amen will be repeated also at that time as the certainty of having encountered God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, of trusting him and of being heard in the necessities of every day. Though I might do the credo of the people of God if I can find the booklet uh, first. So let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, so Rene Ormanita is watching here. Hi there. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Bye now.